Travis, Travis Gilbert. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Travis is the programs and operations coordinator uh, for the old Baldy Baldy Found Foundation. Uh, he uh, does tour tour programs, historic tours, uh, as well as managing the, the museum it's, itself. Okay. Uh, one of your not tour program, but one of your evening programs caught Lisa's attention. Mm -hmm. Might be our historic happy hour. How'd you guess? I say that. I didn't want to get you in trouble. What a concept. <laughs> uh, prior to coming to the Old Baldy Foundation and establishing the historic cocktail hour, <laughs> Travis was the uh, coordinator of the, the Latimer House for the Lower Cape Fear Historical Society. Uh, went to Hood College in, in Maryland, and I have to mention that he grew up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. <laughs> this, this Pennsylvania figured it all out a lot sooner than this, this, one, <laughs> this one did. Right? Um, Travis is going to talk highlights from the old Baldy Foundation collection. So let me have it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, yes, I'm Travis. I'm over at uh, the Old Baldy Foundation. I joined the staff there about a year and a half ago. So today I'm going to try to tell the story of Bald Head Island using a dozen of our pieces from our archival collections in about a half hour. So <laughs> <laughs> let's see how it goes, right? So uh, this is really where the story begins. Uh, we think that one of the first settlements uh, from European descent was a shipyard uh, very close to where Old Baldy Lighthouse is. And this is a nail that was recovered uh, in the mid-1980s <laughs> through a state archaeological dig on the lighthouse grounds. They did five pits, uh, they went down about five feet, and this is one of the many remains that they found over there. And this just shows you what the importance of Bald Head Island is. The story we're telling over there is about man coming over and having a give and a take, a push and a pull between two geographical features that the island is sandwiched right in between. The first being that Cape Fear River, which is the only major river in the entire state that flows into the Atlantic, and the other being Cape Fear, one of three capes in the state of North Carolina. And of course, each of those capes have dangerous shoals that extend miles uh, beyond that point, ours being frying pan shoals. So man over there is simultaneously trying to reap the benefits of that river and that deep water port while simultaneously contending with the dangers of that cape and those shoals. And this really highlights in the mid 18th century man's first attempts to come over there and try to reap the benefits of these waterways. Now, of course, we have economic significance with being situated at the mouth of that only river in the state that flows into the Atlantic. For that same exact reason, we're going to have military significance. So every time war finds these shores, uh, Bald Head Island is going to play a strategic role in uh, kind of capturing uh, this kind of area and having access to supplying those troops that are holding this area. So in uh, the very early spring of 1776, about 5,000 British troops do appear off the coast of Southport and Baldhead Island. Uh, they're uh, aboard a fleet that has orders to reinstill the king's authority here in this rebellious colony. And at least some of those troops from the 57th Regiment of Foot end up disembarking for that fleet <coughs> on Baldhead Island because somebody dropped the button. And it was recovered in the mid-80s during that same archaeological dig. And we know that at least a few dozen of those troops were left behind uh, in the summer of 1776 when a grand majority of those British troops went down and tried their luck at Charleston instead, failed down there. But a few dozen of those did remain at a small fort called Fort George. We don't know where Fort George is anymore on Baldhead Island. We think probably it's in the vicinity of the marsh behind the lighthouse, to the northwest of the lighthouse. Uh, 
but we do know that they packed everything up and abandoned Bald Head Island in early September of 1776 when the 4th North Carolina Continental Troops attacked that British garrison. And the British easily repulsed those troops, but uh, their nerves were shot and they abandoned North Carolina and won't return until 1781. So once this nation uh, forms itself <coughs> under, uh, after the American Revolution, there is a question about what authority rests in the federal government in New York City and later Washington, D.C., and what authorities are going to rest in the individual states. And lighthouses were kind of controversial in 1789. Who would take responsibility? Was it the state of North Carolina and its sister states? or this new fledgling federal government. And North Carolina, man, they tried. They started building the lighthouse in the late 1780s over on Bald Head Island, but due to disease and lack of funding and lack of, of talent in this area, they couldn't get the ball rolling. So in 1781, 1789, when George Washington's administration assumes federal responsibility for the nation's lighthouses, they're going to complete what is the first lighthouse on Bald Head Island. And this is a pen and ink sketch from 1806, uh, roughly 10 years after the lighthouse was constructed. You can see, um, it's only by chance the lighthouse is, is in this sketch. The, uh, the water spout there in the center is what's driving this piece. We don't know who uh, drew this piece here in coastal Cape Fear, but we do know it appears as an etching or an engraving in a Boston newspaper later that year. But it is one of the only likenesses of that original 1796 lighthouse over on Bald Head Island. You can see it was eight-sided, just like Old Baldy is, except what is hidden underneath that foliage there on the left is it stood on a giant square pedestal. And we do know that because the only other likeness we have of this lighthouse is from a map in that same time period. And rather than depicting the lighthouse on that map as a dot or a star, they do just have a miniature drawing, a miniature two-scale drawing of that lighthouse on the map. And we do know it was on a pedestal, which makes only sense because the original Charleston lighthouse was on a pedestal as well, which predates the original lighthouse of Bald Head Island. But you can see how close it was to the water, and that ends up being the demise of that original lighthouse. Uh, it eventually falls into the sea. By 1813, we have a lighthouse keeper writing Washington, D.C., saying that this lighthouse is about ready to collapse, the river's at my doorstep, you better do something. So Congress, they dig in their heels, they appropriate new funds, they bring another New Englander down here named Daniel Way, and Daniel Way constructs Old Baldy as we know it today, finished around the beginning of April, 1817. And Old Baldy has a long tenure from 1817 to about uh, 1935 as a lighthouse showing mariners the way into that ever so important Cape Fear River. And we have many keepers, uh, a little over a dozen keepers that we are aware of that served Old Baldy. Unfortunately, we don't have any of the remaining uniforms uh, for those keepers. But in our collections, we do have a, a circa 1882 lighthouse keeper's uniform that came from Wisconsin. And why this uh, keeper's uniform is important <coughs> is because we have an 1893 photograph of Old Baldy. It's the only known photograph of Old Baldy from the 19th century. And Sonny Dozier uh, is standing there at attention in one of those photographs wearing a very, very similar uniform. So this is you know, our best shot at interpreting what Sonny, Sonny Dozier would have worn in the late 19th century. And unfortunately, this was one of the only pieces in our collection that was damaged during Hurricane Florence. Uh, everything else was evacuated. I simply ran out of time and ran out of muscle to get this monster out of its case. I foolishly thought that it would be protected in its case. It was not. Uh, so we worked with a conservator that uh, works with Trying Palace in New Bern. She's up in New Bern named Lynn Lancaster Gorgeous. 
and I helped as much as I could to dry and wet wash this about seven times. We finally got all the mold spores out and I gotta be honest with you, we didn't realize how dirty it was even before the storm. <laughs> because it was not that blue even before the storm. So uh, this uniform is back home. And, and as an aside to this whole experience, I always a learning experience for our staff about what to do when the next hurricane comes along. Lynn Lancaster Gorgeous actually found a laundry tag that was inside of the uniform. And it was inside of the uniform because this was a hand-me-down. Uh, there was a second life to it that we don't know who, where, or what, but it was taken down. The guy was obviously a little smaller than the original mm -hmm. occupant, so that laundry tag got tucked into um, the, the stitching, basically. And that laundry tag revealed that it was James Ginty's. And James Ginty, he was an Irish immigrant in the 1850s. Uh, he and his wife came into Wisconsin, like so many Irish did. He served in the American Civil War in two different regiments. He had a break uh, in between his two tenures. And like so many Civil War vets, Sonny Dozier was a Civil War veteran, ended up being keeper at Old Baldy. He joined the Federal uh, Lighthouse Bureau and served at Racine Harbor Lighthouse, which is near Green Bay, and served there for decades until he retired in the late 1880s. The newspaper records say that he was really a quite a public figure in that very urban lighthouse. It's, that's the coolest thing about the story is he had a much different experience than Sunny Dozier. They're serving roughly at the same time that Sunny Dozier is over there in the wilderness that is called Mid Island. And James Ginty was right smack in the middle of Racine, which like Wilmington was growing exponentially during the mid and late 19th century because of its access to the waterway. Well, thank goodness for Florence. Thank goodness for Florence. There was a silver lining. There was a silver lining there. Thank you. It was a blue lining. So the lighthouse keepers, uh, not only do we have their uniforms, we know that they're not always working. They have vices, and they have games, and whatnot. And man, we have so many pipe stems and kaolin pipe bowls. Uh, I don't even know what to do with half of them. But this is one of our most detail-oriented pieces. It actually was at the Cape Fear Museum, uh, its predecessor, it was under another name, on a temporary loan here for a while for an exhibit on the Masons, the Freemasons. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see why it has a beautiful federal eagle with a shield on it. And I think it harps back to this idea that who is going to control the Lighthouse Bureau? The states or the federal government? And when the federal government takes responsibility for the lighthouses, it ends up taking on a symbolic role, the Lighthouse Service, of what this nation represents. That it's exchange of ideas and exchange of goods all centers around a republic, a free state. And of course our right to vote and our citizenship is going to keep expanding in the 19th century, but these lighthouse keepers in the 19th century were very proud of that. And this lighthouse keeper is smoking uh, um, some tobacco with a pipe that has this beautiful bald eagle that is, again, another symbol for this growing and expanding republic that was saved in the mid-19th century. We have dominoes, we have um, lots of liquor bottles, <laughs> uh, all kinds of good stuff. So they weren't, it wasn't just all work over there. So of course, war is going to find Bald Head Island uh, once again when the American Civil War breaks out for those same reasons. When the federal blockade uh, takes control of North Carolina around July of 1861 and grows from then onward, the Confederacy is going to have to pr uh, protect the Cape Fear River to keep importing those vital supplies into the Port of Wilmington that can be railroaded up to Richmond. And as an aside, right before uh, the Civil War, Old Baldy was destined to be destroyed. In a dramatic sense of irony, the Civil War actually saved Old Baldy Lighthouse from construction rather than destroying the lighthouse as we know it today. 
and it all begins with a bright young engineer named William Henry Chase Whiting, who graduates from West Point in the 1830s, and as this bright young engineer, he joins the United States Lighthouse Bureau, and they send him as a lighthouse engineer to North Carolina, and he begins one by one laying plans for knocking down the short, stubby, improperly located dim <laughs> lighthouses that simply aren't effective. Don't tell old Baldy, but she was never good for job. <laughs> she was too short, she was too dim, and she wasn't close enough to Cape Fear. So General Whitey first begins up in Beaufort, North Carolina. He replaces the previous Cape Lookout lighthouse built around uh, 1812 and builds that beautiful 159 foot diamond lighthouse we all love and cherish today. <coughs> His next stop was Southport. He fell in love with a Southport girl and ended up marrying her. And he laid up plans to knock down Old Baldy and build a 150 foot brick tower that would look something very similar to Cape Hatteras or Cape Lookout or Kruita. And uh, Congress appropriates funds in June of 1860 and then the Civil War breaks out, and Old Baldy finds itself in another nation, and the engineer, William Henry Chase Whiting, finds himself becoming Major General William Henry Chase Whiting. <laughs> and when he doesn't get along with General Robert E. Lee up in Richmond, where do they send him? None other than back home here to Cape Fear. And he is responsible for not only building Fort Fisher, Fort Hamwell, uh, Fort Johnson or Pender here in Southport, Fort Anderson, but Fort Holmes here on Baldhead Island, which is on the western extremity of the island. It's a 1.7 mile long earthen and sand fortification. It has five batteries or areas where there are cannons. The most common type of artillery in this fort are 32 pounder rifle pieces. Our largest was a 10 inch Columbia, fired about 150 pound cannonball for three miles. So as we all are aware, it's Fort Fisher, Fort Anderson, there's some massive pieces of artillery in our fortifications protecting Cape Fear. And it is staffed by about 1,200 troops from the 40th North Carolina Infantry. These soldiers, their enemy was not the Union soldiers and sailors lurking off of our shores, it's Bulkhead Island's environment itself. And there's a long tenure of uncovering remains on Bulkhead Island during construction. It's happened as recently as 2010. That specific individual was an enslaved person that was impressed to build these fortifications here on the island. So this is a map that we purchased uh, just a few years ago um, from a sale that uh, I brought along today, along with all these other pieces that show you the extent of this fort. Uh, we do have a little bit remaining of that fort over on Baldhead Island about a quarter mile of the stretch of the fort. The rest is succumbing to that river, just like that previous lighthouse. That bottom corner <coughs> near Battery Homes is what it's depicting, that is all now underwater. That would have been extremely close in proximity to that original lighthouse that also fell into the river. And once uh, Fort Fisher falls in January of 1865, of course, Fort Holmes and Southport are now rendered behind enemy lines, so the Confederates do evacuate the fort, and we're uncovering, as we speak, a long history in the summer of 1865, as the war is wrapping up, that this camp was used as a refugee camp for newly emancipated enslaved people. Union military authorities up in Wilmington are bringing these enslaved people from the mainland in Brunswick and Hanover counties and taking them over onto Baldwin Island where there's available land, there are facilities and infrastructure here that kind of warrants a camp, and they're beginning to give these people rations and medical care to assimilate themselves into their new life as a free person in Reconstruction America. And this is a story that's very similar because it happens in James City outside of New Bern and Roanoke Island and Hilton Head, South Carolina, so many other barrier islands in the Carolinas. So to be continued on that one, we're still kind of digging up and looking through the records to continue that story. So once the Civil War concludes, another federal service finds itself headquartered on Baldhead Island, and it is the United States Life Saving Service. Uh, it does, uh, some elements of it do, uh, do predate the American Civil War, 
But it's not until about the 1870s, after several horrific shipwrecks occur up near Magshead, North Carolina, there's a public outcry to create some sort of federal service that is responsible for protecting our beaches and protecting our coastline. And the life-saving service is that. You can think of it as a precursor to the Coast Guard. It wasn't built until 12 years after they established the service that they finally get to Cape Fear to build a station. And these men live in a big dormitory-style house, often with their wife and children out on Baldhead Island. And they maintain a vigil out over Cape Fear in those dangerous shoals, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And they have really two options in order to respond when a shipwreck occurs. The first option is they're gonna pull out this Lyle gun, which is a small howitzer cannon. They're firing a cannonball essentially with a rope attached. That cannonball hits the wrecked vessel, delivering that end of the rope to the vessel. Once that is established, they put a pulley on that rope with a breeches buoy attached. Breeches buoy is that life preserver, that donut-shaped cork-filled life preserver we're all familiar with, except this one has a pair of pants, or breeches, floral breeches, sewed into the hull. So the pulley is delivering the breeches buoy to the wrecked vessel. Some brave soul is the first person to climb into the pair of pants <laughs> and holding on for dear life because they are rappelling down over the rope, over the shoals, the whole way to the shore. And this is a black uh, powder can that we were fortunate enough to be donated from a gentleman in Wilmington who's quite the aficionado of, of Coast Guard history. Uh, that would have held uh, the black powder to discharge that cannonball to save these uh, stranded mariners in the graveyard of the Atlanta. And of course, the other option, because let's face it, this wild gun only has a few hundred yards range, is to launch their surf boats. We do have, very fortunate enough, one of the private clubs over in Baldhead Island has some massive uh, two scale um, surf boats or uh, lifeboats over there that we need to use as a teaching. Travis, is that conducted with DuPont facility yeah. or location? Is that indicated on that? It probably is. Delaware? Yeah, it says Delaware. Yeah. In Delaware. Yeah. So uh, back to Old Baldy and its inadequacies. Uh, so we have the life-saving life service there on Cape Fear, but they need their partner in crime to protect uh, the coast off of Cape Fear. They're saving these rescued mariners, but whose responsibility is to have kind of a preemptive strategy to warn them before a gale blows them into those shoals. And it ends up being the third and final lighthouse constructed on Baldwin Island called Cape Fear Station. They go back to the drawing board once the Civil War concludes, and rather than destroying Old Baldy and starting anew, they're gonna keep Old Baldy as a range light showing the way to the river and construct a brand new 150 foot lighthouse out on the Cape. It's called Cape Fear Light, uh, Light Station. It serves from 1903 to 1958. A big difference between Cape Fear Light Station and so many other lighthouses that are somewhat romanticized on our coast is that this is a skeletal lighthouse, meaning that it's a big wrought iron and steel structure that we consider today kind of like a giant power line pole or cell phone tower, if you will. And at the top of this lighthouse, it is a first order Fresnel lens. So you see Old Baldy is illuminated basically by a giant chandelier, hanging from the chandelier, <laughs> it's, uh, pans of whale oil, later kerosene, they have wicks coming out of them, and later on they're gonna put copper kind of reflectors behind those wicks to bounce those lights out. Well, lighthouse technology is revolutionized between Old Baldy's construction in 1817, Cape Fear Light Station's construction in 1903, and it's all thanks to a French physicist by the name of Augustin Jean Fresnel. So Mr. Fresnel discovers the ability to refract or bend light. You can imagine a wick back at Old Baldy, the wick is emitting light 360 degrees around that flame. That's a lot of wasted light. The light that's going upwards and downwards and landwards and every angle in between is not doing the mariner any good out at sea. So Mr. Fresnel discovers the ability to use glass to refract or bend all that wasted light into one consolidated beam that can be projected parallel to the horizon seaward. 
completely revolutionized his lighthouse technology forever. And the lenses took his last name, we call them Fresnel lenses. They came in six orders or sizes, the first being the largest and the most powerful, and the sixth being the weakest and the smallest. So to compare, when Old Baldy is outfitted with this new technology, they gave her a third order lens and later on a fourth order lens, right there in the middle of the spectrum. Cape Fear Light Station was so important and Cape Fear was so feared, they gave it a first order Fresnel lens. By 1838, when it's electrified, it could emit the light coming from that 500 watt light bulb 18 and a half miles to see. That's how powerful this refracting or technology is. Pardon me. And we're very, very fortunate not only to have one of the last remaining light bulbs um, from that station, from the descendants of Captain Charlie, a lighthouse keeper there, we also have that 6,000 pound Fresnel lens. Uh, is in storage. It was uh, somewhat sold off piece by piece from an antique stealer off of Oleander Drive in Wilmington, but we have slowly as an organization been able to uh, bring some of those pieces back home. They've been found under beds in the Outer Banks and in the flea markets in Raleigh, but they're slowly coming back to us. And one day we hope to have a facility to be able to exhibit this reconstructed Fresnel lens and to continue our efforts on finding these lost pieces and bringing them back home. Now, for 30 years, one man serves as principal light keeper at Cape Fear Light Station, and he becomes really the first mayor of Baldhead Island, really. His name is Charles Norton Swan. Everybody calls him by his nickname, Captain Charlie. And his father served in the Lighthouse Bureau. He serves in the Navy in the Spanish-American War. He has a stint at uh, Mosquito Inlet. We call it Ponce de Leon Lighthouse today. Later served at Little Cumberland Island, Georgia. Then in 1903, he has an opportunity to come back home here and serve for 30 years at Cape Fear Light Station. And we have uh, most of his manuscripts that were left behind. We are also fortunate enough to have his pocket watch and his binoculars. And uh, who knows, he may have used these binoculars looking for the Yahoo. And the Yahoo is our Bigfoot-style creature on Baldhead Island. See, Captain Charlie raised nine kids over there. One wife passed away and he married again and she brought some stepchildren along. So there were nine kids in his household. There were two assistant light keepers with all their kids. All those life-saving service station kids were enough kids over there to warrant the construction of a one-room schoolhouse in the early 20th century. So imagine all the trouble that kids find themselves into now on Baldwin Island. <laughs> and what about in 1903? With all kinds of trouble and not too much help. So Captain Charlie invented this mythological creature called a Yahoo, and the Yahoo had an affinity for eating small children. <laughs> the scrub came out at night, and he took this myth making as far to make a plaster cast of its footprint, and uh, we have that footprint today, and that's how we scared all nine kids home at night before the dangers of the island could wake up. <laughs> so who knows, he may have used these uh, to be searching for that creature. Now, as a kind of epitaph for Old Ball, or for Captain Charlie, uh, he did retire in 1933. Retired about three months after an assistant light keeper was found dead at the top of Cape Fear Light Station, went into cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So I like to think that he saw his own mortality in that situation, promptly called it quits and retired from the Southport. In 1958, when they finished Oak Island Lighthouse, he is the gentleman that flips the switch to light that lighthouse for the very first time. So it's a nice kind of uh, paying respect or tribute to that man that served for so long at Cape Fear Light Station. We have one more war that visits Old Baldy's uh, lighthouse at Baldhead Island, and that is World War II, when these German U-boat submarines hang around North Carolina's three different capes, seeking to torpedo merchant vessels, cargo ships, and oil tankers, trying to disrupt trade between the Allies. So the life-saving service that is now the United States Coast Guard operates mounted horse patrols on Baldhead Island and coastlines all across America. We give the coast a horse and a dog. The dog is used to sniff and try to see if the Germans are landing to commit acts of espionage. 
there's a terrible rumor that German German soldiers were found with uh, movie ticket stubs from the movie theater in Southport. <laughs> we have been told by so many historians that's utterly false, nor did they not shell purity beans and whatnot. Uh, but these are the men that uh, you know had those dogs and had the horses. The horses were used not only for transportation up and down the beaches, but when they had a sighting out there, they'd race that horse back to Old Baldy that had a new life as a radio tower, a beacon. They radio up to Wilmington and bring down a bomber to bomb that German U-boat. But of course, like the lighthouse keepers, it isn't always work at Baldhead Island. There was time for play as well, and the ladies at Southport sure did enjoy their time over on Baldhead Island. <laughs> and we have a beautiful um, photograph collection from World War II from two individuals chronicling their service, service over there in the 1940s, and this is one of my favorite pictures. Our photograph collection spans about uh, two centuries. Uh, we have, my goodness, about 3,000 photographs. We're slowly digitizing those and making them available on our website. Now, once World War II concludes, the bomb falls out of the tub on Baldhead Island. Uh, the Coast Guard is the last federal service uh, on Baldhead Island. Old Baldy's decommissioned in 1935. Cape Fear Light Station is blown up by dynamite in 1958 when Oak Island Lighthouse is completed. And uh, the Coast Guard Station is rendered deactivated in 1945 at the conclusion of World War II. So there's a big question about what this island is going to be used for in the mid and late 20th centuries. And for the longest time, it's owned by Frank Sherrill, uh, who's from Charlotte. He has grand plans and envisions kind of a, a beach resort. There's a depiction of it, kind of looks like Myrtle Beach in a sense, with high rises and Ferris wheels and canals going through the island, going to individual condos. That doesn't end up being so, in that because in 1971, Frank Sherrill sells Baldhead Island to Carolina Cape Fear Corporation. It is the first, I call, modern developer to own Baldhead Island. And Carolina Cape Fear Corporation almost immediately begins construction on the golf course. The golf course is uh, does predate an overwhelming majority of the homes on Baldhead Island. And they also attempt to begin construction on a marina to get reliable access to Baldhead Island. But that marina hits a roadblock, and that roadblock are well-organized environmental activists were very concerned about the development of Baldhead Island. And they have a sympathetic ear in Democratic Governor Bob Scott. So through backward political deals, basically the permit to build that marina is held hostage from Carolina Cape Fear Corporation. And the result is they have to ferry people back and forth across that river using a floating dock. Many of the homeowners that used their own personal boats in the 1970s to reach the island have to use a floating dock in the marsh. They can only get on or off the island two hours on each side of high tide. So there are plenty of stories of these folks wading to shore with their luggage over their heads. <laughs> so let's face it, uh, the development of Baldhead Island, a successful development, is not going to occur without a reliable transportation system and a marina faci to facilitate this growth. So because of that roadblock and because of those grassroots efforts of those environmental activists, Carolina Cape Fear Corporation does go bankrupt in the late 1970s. And it sits in a state of limbo or bankruptcy. It falls and reverts back into principal stockholders. There's a Baldhead Island Corporation there for a minute until it comes under the ownership of the current developer, which is the uh, Baldhead Island Limited and that is the Mitchell family from Galveston, Texas. And there is a precedent of the Mitchell family being a developer. If anyone's familiar with the Woodlands, uh, that was their brainchild uh, just outside of Houston, Texas today. <coughs> so the Mitchells are who give many of these appeasements to these environmental activists that create the character that is Baldhead Island today. They continue the legacy of banning gas-powered recreational vehicles on the island in favor of electric <coughs> cars. 
they are the ones responsible for donating land and funds to establish the Balkanadan Conservancy, a stakeholder for the ecology of Balkan Island, uh, Balkan Island. They are the individuals that create my employer. They donate the lighthouse and the land around it to establish a not-for-profit. They uh, donate additional land to create a maritime forest preserve. And lastly, they <coughs> create this master plan that caps or limits the development of the island at 2,000 homes. They say we're not ever gonna have more than 2,000 homes. We're a little over 1,300 today. There will never be 2,000 homes because many of these plots have now been donated to a Smith Island Land Trust, meaning that land is protected just like the maritime forest, just like the marsh, can never be built upon, and that is subtracting from that 2,000 total. So if you'd like to continue this story, there's a lot that I missed today uh, in order to give you the big picture. Uh, we are open uh, at least until Labor Day, Monday through Saturday, from 9 to 5. And on Sunday, we open at 11. You can climb Old Baldy Lighthouse. We have the Smith Island Museum of History, which is within a reconstructed circa 1850 lighthouse keeper's cottage. There are three cottages on our compound, and we are interpreting the second li uh, lighthouse keeper's cottage that had the longest tenure uh, on the island and is the cottage that Sonny Dozier lived in over there. We also have a fascinating and really comprehensive experience for day trippers on Baldwin Island, and that is the Baldwin Island Historic Tour. Uh, if anyone's ever been to Baldwin Island, it can be difficult to navigate around. The golf cart rentals are not particularly the most inexpensive uh, luxury. Uh, we take all the stress off of you during the Historic Tour program. Uh, you arrive on the 10 a.m. ferry, myself or like on a day like today my cohorts pick you up from the ferry terminal we load you up in a golf cart if you're lucky we're sold out and we'll make you drive your own golf cart which is uh, <laughs> a lot of people enjoy that uh, we take you for two hours all around the island going into depth about these four centuries of the island's history using the landscape to interpret and to tell that story we take a break at the Maritime Market about halfway through for a little bit of shopping, some ACs, some snacks, some restrooms. We pick you up on the uh, back end. We take you inside one of the private beach clubs on the island that's situated right on Cape Fear. We conclude at the lighthouse about two hours in where your admission includes the lighthouse experience, the museum, and also 10% off in our gift shop. All those proceeds go to uh, saving that lighthouse. So it goes to a good cause. It was like a shop for a good cause. And then I think a step down from that experience, if you're looking something a little more intimate, something a little more specialized, is on Thursdays we do offer a walking tour that explores the remains of Fort Holmes. Uh, that was a brainchild of this year. I was going to go on strike if I had to repeatedly only spend 10 minutes a day talking about the Civil War. And so now I get an hour once a week and I'm going to have a camper. <laughs> but if you'd like to reach out, we have about 2,400 pieces in our archival collection. It's all accessible to the public. We also have uh, over 100 vertical files that can be loaned out for your own personal research. There's a treasure trove of information out there. We're trying to make it accessible as much as we can to the public. This winter we did accession and digitize a grand majority of our collection available at oldbaldy.org or the history and the archives tab on the main menu. Uh, if not, reach out to my cell phone number or my email if you have any more uh, research to do and your own genealogy or your back end. And, uh, if you want to just continue this conversation as someone who enjoys our local history, I'd be glad to talk your ear off. I really appreciate the Historical Society for thanking, uh, for having me here today. I thank you though for their support and uh, thank you all for being here. Question or Sure, absolutely. Questions, folks? Yeah, what's the experience cost? Oh, okay, so it's $30 a person. And the ferry is limited by extra. The ferry is extra, unfortunately. Yeah, we would 
we don't make any money on that ferry. It's a big, you know, uh, somehow it gets lost in translation that we have all these special perks or special deals on the side with the ferry. Unfortunately, in all our experiences, the ferry is on your own. Uh, we do, if you do have a large group, and it tends to be more formalized group, like the Historical Society, we can work and get a discount for that ferry yeah. rather than $23 at $17.50. But that's something that's a little kind of, kind of don't want to share it with and preach to the world about that experience. But with groups like we have the Civil War, or excuse me, the Revolutionary War Roundtable coming, and they're taking advantage of that discount. Your mission, our mission are compatible. We're happy to arrange uh, some, some of those discounts for you all. Yes, ma'am. Uh, at the top of the lighthouse, the light seems to be off center. Of course. Why is that? <laughs> all right. So the lantern up there is off centered. That is because, so in, on the original lighthouse that was taken over by the river, they had a blacksmith named Samuel Wheeler in Philadelphia in the late 18th century forge that lantern. And like most of the bricks that uh, composed that original lighthouse, the lantern was also recycled. They moved all those bricks, all the lantern, all the apparatus, moved it about a mile away from the river inland and recycled and rebuilt the lighthouse as we know as Old Baldwin today. So that lanthorn has sat up there for decades until it became just pretty darn rusted after the Civil War and they decided to replace it. Well, rather than starting again for the drawing board, they decided, decided to recycle one yet again. And they found one in Sullivan's Island, South Carolina. When they brought it up, they realized that it, it was not large enough to both be centered on the top of Old Baldwin's roof and still cover that off-centered hatch carved into the roof of Old Baldwin <laughs> you used to access that room. So of course the priority is in off-centering it so water doesn't seep down into the lighthouse. So it's off-centered today. And there aren't too many other examples of that in the nation. It's <laughs> one of the things that makes it very unique. And, and the other unique characteristic about Old Baldwin, it's not the best picture for it, is it's camouflage. Every other lighthouse, I mean, so many people when they're going on these lighthouse trips, they love the day markers, the diamonds, the swirls, the stripes. We don't have that. We have this organic patchwork camouflage appearance. Well, it's stucco, it's a fancy term for concrete. When they originally made stucco, it was made indigenously with oyster shells and pebbles and whatnot mixed with imported lime. Well, no one wrote down the original recipe of the stucco. <laughs> the stucco falls off, wears off, and needs to be replaced. So what that is, is 202 years of contractors mixing up new batches of stucco, mm -hmm. buying a little bit different recipe, along with aging and erosion, produces a little bit different of a color each time. And that has accumulated to create that appearance. Now, it always would have been whitewashed by the lighthouse keeper. So up until 1935 and a few years later, it would have been all white like Ochre Coast Lighthouse. But it was a conscious decision by the board of directors uh, for the Old Baldy Foundation to not whitewash it. I think to get into their minds, it, it, it's just, it's so darn unique and it's memorable. There are 100 million white lighthouses, but there's only one that looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> so people remember it. Yeah, did, did Bald Head Island play any role in the blockade runners during the Civil War, or was that mostly up in Fort Fisher? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So Fort Holmes was created to keep the United States Navy further out to sea and also assist those blockade runners coming in and out of the river. And there are tons of blockade runners that uh, had to intentionally be run aground on Bald Head Island because they were being chased. The most famous example is that in early December of 1864, a blockade runner called the Ella was being chased, trying to reach Old Inlet. The pilot and the captain made a decision to run it into Bald Head Island, South Beach. And fortunately for all those Confederate troops, the Ella was full of whiskey and wine and rum. <laughs> <laughs> the writing was on the wall at that point. The war was going to end. The morale was very low. It was Christmas time. Party. These yeah. <laughs> they party. 
<laughs> we have a letter in our archives of boys writing home to dad saying that even the chaplain has some pretty queer graces at the mess hall. It was not the lore legend. There was a party for about three weeks on Balm and <laughs> And that party's interrupted Christmas Eve by the, the boom of cannon to the north that's announced that Fort Fisher is being attacked. Mm -hmm. So plenty of blockade runner stories out there. There's even a Union uh, blockader that uh, ran aground accidentally mm -hmm. out towards the Cape. Uh, can't see the remains, but they're about a mile off of our of our east beach. So that's historical cocktail hour fits right in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Perfect. Well, and, and December we're going to do 1864. So <laughs> twice a year we dress up. We did it this past weekend, or two weekends ago now, for National Lighthouse Weekend. We interpreted 1918. There was a resort out there. Uh, think of Lumen Station for Wrightsville Beach or the Pavilion at Carolina Beach. Uh, there was a, a kind of a resort out there. It failed during the Great Depression. So we interpreted 1918 during her historic happy hour. We dressed up, played characters, and in Christmas, we'll do it yet again, and we'll be doing 1864, and it'll be the party from Yella. So, <laughs> I'd love to have you. The, the fairies run all night, so there's, uh, you know, there's always the next fairy if you want to join us. So I did bring uh, everything that I shared on the PowerPoint with us today. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to share it if you want to walk on up. Uh, after we dismiss here, be glad to kind of interact with you with some of those possessions. Thank you very much.